Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah 33. We are going to be going through some, a lot of verses tonight. And so uh, get ready. And uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this evening and we ask, Lord, for your guidance and direction. We pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts. Show us Jesus on these pages. May we see his promise and that they are steadfast and true. What you've promised, you will keep, you will perform. And so, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the remembrance from the word of God tonight that admonishes us, exhorts us to live for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you remember... When we were together the last time, Jeremiah in chapter 32 began a series of prophecies and we're told that Jeremiah was placed in prison for these prophecies. He was placed in prison by a man by the name of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. He was put in prison because he prophesied to the people of Judah to surrender to the Babylonians. And because Zedekiah was upset over this prophecy, he shut him up in prison. Well, chapter 33 is a continuation of that prophecy. God is coming to Jeremiah, speaking to him about saying certain things, prophesying certain things. Even though he's shut up in prison, he hasn't shut up verbally and by written oracles of God, by speaking the word of God out. And so he says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up, in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker of it, the Lord who formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call upon me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. One of my favorite promises for those that will call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon me. Pray to me. Ask me so that I might be able to show you things that you, that you don't know, that you haven't experienced. And isn't that what prayer is all about anyway? Is asking God for things that we haven't received, that we haven't obtained, that we need, and maybe even at times want. <laughs> but those things that we want and, and desire from the Lord, he has is, he is told us to call upon him. The open, open invitation to just say, God, here I am. Will you just meet my needs? And he says, come, call upon me, and I will answer you. Notice the emphatic statement. God says, I will answer you. Now, in this case, in Judah's case, you remember Jeremiah has been told by God, don't pray for these people any longer. They're going away in judgment. They're going away into captivity. So Jeremiah already knows, You're not, these people are going away. They're going away for 70 years. But it hasn't stopped Jeremiah from praying that God's mercy would be upon them as they go, as they go into captivity, that God's promises would be there to bring them back and reestablish them in the land after 70 years of captivity. And so he says, God says, call upon me. And I will show you great and mighty things which you know not. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the house of, houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the, by the surge mount or the, by the ramps of the, um, the Babylonians and by the sword. They come to fight with the, the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men, whom I have slain in my anger and in my fury. 
And because of all those wickedness, I have hidden my face from this city. Now, they have, they're going to put up a fight. The children of Israel are going to put up a fight against the, the Babylonians. Matter of fact, God said to them, you have either, you can die of the pestilence, you can buy, die of the famine, you can die of the sword, or you can live in captivity. Those are your choices. And so they're going to now see if they can fight. They, they didn't do it very well. Matter of fact, they, they were slaughtered, basically. But I often are, are reminded of the times where God came out to the children of Israel and told them in unbelievable odds that if they'll just trust him, they'll win. Remember when um, Asa, the king, went out, he, actually the Ethiopians had come up against Israel. I think if I'm not mistaken, it was a million man army. Ethiopians coming up to fight against Israel. And as they gathered themselves, God gave them victory over the Ethiopians. And they came back and God met Asa with his prophet and said, Asa, the Lord is with you as long as you're with him. But the day that you get kind of haughty, proud, self-sufficient, then I won't be with you any longer. And, um, and because Asa prayed, he, he said, Lord, it's not, it really isn't anything for you to deliver us with a few men or many men. It doesn't matter what, what your sight. And that was his prayer before he went into battle. His prayer was, God, it doesn't matter if there's one guy out there on the battlefield or a or hundred million. It, it, it's up to you. If you're going to give us a victory, the victory is ours no matter how big or how big the odds are against us. It's all up to you. And that's when God sent the prophet. I, I'm with you, Asa, and I'll be with you. But he reminded Asa. Now, Asa blew it. Later on, Asa started to lean to the flesh and lean to his own understanding and God had to rebuke him and said, because now, he said, when you were little in your own eyes, Asa, you were able to depend on me. But now that you've gotten some success and some type of, of notoriety and some uh, type of victory in your life, now you started to lean on, on yourself, upon your own abilities, on your own understanding. And now, because of that, Asa was brought down. Well, See, we see the same thing going on with the king of Judah. They have some minor success, and they thought that, that, well, basically what happened was they were getting ready to go to battle, and the Babylonians left. Because, you see, the Babylonians decided we've got to take care of the Egyptians first. And the Babylonians left and went down to Egypt to fight. Well, they thought, hey, we've got victory. But God in this chapter is going to tell them, no, they're going to come back and they're going to finish the fight that they started with you. And you're going to go away. Well, God begins to deal with them. And, uh, and it's not very good. God's not giving them very much hope. But know one thing, that whenever it is the darkest, it's never the end in the life of the children of God. Whenever it's the darkest of any event or any time, it's never the end to the children of God. Because you know why? Because it's actually really the beginning of the day. It's the beginning of the light. You know, it, it's one thing that Alan Redpath used to say often. He says, when you're at the end of yourself, you're at the beginning of God. And, and one of the things that I used to enjoy is just to realize, I'm at the end. have anybody ever been at the end of themselves? You didn't know how to take care of whatever? Well, they were just at the beginning of God. Usually it's at that time where you really release the thing to God because you can't hold on to it anymore. It's too big for you. 
And here, many times we come to the end and we think it's all over with, and we realize morning's just dawning. And so God says in verse 6, Behold, I will bring it health. <laughs> Even though he says you're going you're gonna to die, the wickedness is in your city, it's gonna, the Chaldeans are going to, going to fill, the dead, uh, fill your uh, valleys with dead men's and, and, and everything else, and my anger and my fury is there. He says, Behold, I will bring it health and cure it. I will cure them, and I will revi uh, reveal unto them, abund uh, them the abundance of peace and truth. God says, even though I'm bringing all this judgment upon you, I'm still going to bring a healing to you. That's amazing, the grace of God. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and, and will build them as it was at first. I'm going to restore them just like they were at the beginning. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquities by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities in which they have sinned and in which they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy. Oh, listen to this. Israel will be a name of joy one day. Now, is that true today? I don't think so. Israel is by far praise on the people's lips today as he goes on he says and it shall be to me a name of joy a praise and an honor before all nations of the earth who shall hear all the good that I do unto them and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto them God says one of these days Israel is going to be just the just the talk of the town the talk of the nations. They, it's, they're going to be the joy of everybody's conversation. Now, we look today and we realize <laughs> Israel's by far the joy of everybody. I mean, let's just face it today. Just in our news today, we, we, it was amazing what's happening. I, I'm more convinced now we're closer to going home than we've ever been. I mean, I am, I am more excited now. And I got to keep reminding myself. Because I, I, get, I get wrapped up in the news. And I begin to get wrapped up in the politics of it all. And, and everything else like that. And, and I, I, I got to kick myself, Roger. Remember, the Lord's in control. God's in control. It's his timetable, right? And, and, and he's going to do what he has purpose to do and no man is going to thwart it I've got to remind myself of that because you see I'm a citizen not of this world and neither are you you're a citizen of the kingdom of God and because of that well we should be involved in certain things we're to be in prayer and engaged in prayer for for things but nonetheless we should be waiting watching for the Lord's return, because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. We're going to be snatched out of here. And then Henry Kissinger can have his seven years. And so <clears throat> it says, Thus saith the Lord, again, there shall be heard in this place, which ye shall, shall be desolate, without man and without beasts, even in, in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without habitation and without beasts, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of, of the bride, the voice of them who shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And of those who shall bring the sacrifices of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. And so God says, and really what happened when Babylon came and took away Zedekiah and the captives of Israel, of Judah, he burned the, burned the city down. Still today, you can go down to the city of Ophel, and there is a layer about six inches of ash 
that the archaeologists can point to and show you where when they burned the city, they burned it thoroughly. And it was absolutely barren for years. There was no cry of the beast or, or people or weddings, or the bridegroom and the groom. And there was no, nothing there. It was desolate. And God says, I'm going to bring you back. And those voices are going to be heard once again in your street. And they were. God kept his promise. Well, they shall return, God says. So thus saith the Lord of hosts, again in this place, which is desolate without man and without beast and in all its cities, shall be a habitation of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. Shepherds are going to return and they're going to bring their, their flocks back. And in the cities of the mountains and in the cities of the valleys and in the cities of the south, and in the land of Benjamin, and in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah shall the flocks pass again under the hands of him that counteth or telleth them, saith the Lord. Now this word counteth, or, or it's a shepherd's term. It, it's a term that, that, the Lord, that the shepherd, every time his flock would come, he would, they used the word telleth, or he would count them, not only just by number, but he would examine each one of them. It's a beautiful uh, picture of, of the shepherd looking at each one as they were out grazing out in the, in the hill country. God would bring them back into the fold for the evening time to protect them from the wolves at night. And as they come into the fold, he would examine each one. He would check their legs. He would check their sides. And he would check their faces to make sure that there was nothing on them, no ticks or no, uh, no scrapes or cuts upon them. Because if they were, he would apply the oil and, and anything that would cure them as he brought them. And if there was one missing, he would go out and find it. You remember how he, he, he counts the, the, the hundred sheep. And if there was one out, he'll go out and get it. He counteth them. And so God says, when he brings them back, the shepherds will be back in the fields of Bethlehem. Is basically what he's talking around Benjamin. Benjamin is the, is, is, is the area of Bethlehem. And, and also of Judah. Shall the flocks pass again under the hands of him that counteth them, saith the Lord. Behold. And it's interesting, still those same, the same, same hills today are still used for the, the sheep and the goats of, of the Palestinians and the Bedouins that are out there in the hills. The same fields that, that David tended his flocks and the same fields that, that Boaz gleaned his fields and, and Ruth and the same fields here, God says they're going to be doing that and still today they're doing it. It's amazing. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Now, he takes us and he thrusts us into time, into a, a period of time that's not happened yet. It, it has happened in, in part, but not completely, as we'll see. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I promise unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. What and who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about none other than Jesus Christ. He who will execute justice and righteousness in the land. The stem or the branch of Jesse. We know this out of the scriptures already. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in, in uh, Jeremiah 23, we're told that the Lord himself is going to be called that branch and, and, and also the, the Lord of righteousness. Now Israel, later on in the next verse, is going to be called the, 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 the righteousness of the Lord as well. But it's also the Lord. And so he is going to execute. I'm reminded of the book of Jude where he talks about Enoch saying, And behold, he shall come within thousands of his saints to execute what? justice 
upon all the ungodly for all their ungodly deeds and all those ungodly things that they've done. And so we're told here that he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. That thousand year reign of Christ when he comes back in his second coming. And I think that's why the Jews have today that, that problem because there are so many passages in the scriptures that talk about the second coming of Christ or him coming and reigning. But there are those passages like Psalms 22 and Isaiah 53 and various passages. Matter of fact, we're going to see later on in Jeremiah where he's going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And, and we see these prophecies where there's, there, it's directly talking about the Lord's betrayal and crucifixion and burial and resurrection. But yet they always saw also the Messiah reigning and ruling for a thousand years. And how could somebody suffer so badly at the hands of men and be killed and punished as, as, he, as he was in a sense? By God, as Isaiah 53, but yet rule and reign. How can that be unless there's two comings? You can only explain it by the first coming and, the, and this, this time space now that we have called the age of grace, the church age, and him coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And so we see that, that he's going to rule, he's going to execute judgment and Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to establish his kingdom and he's going to rule for a thousand years. And in those days shall Judah be saved. Ladies, you should know this by your Monday night Bible studies through the book of Romans that in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 talks about how Israel was cast off. That wild branch was cast off and how we, the wild branch, the, the, the natural branch, the olive branch, has been cast off. And we, this, this wild branch, has been grafted in that we might be able to be partakers of this age of grace by the Lord. And that God blinded the Jews in part. But as Paul continues on in there, that God opens up their eyes once again, and he quotes here that Israel shall be saved. And there's going to be a remnant that will be saved. Oh. Well, I was thinking about that today in the prophecies in Zechariah where he talks about, and also in Revelations where it talks about how the Antichrist is going to fight against the Jews. And there's 12, 13 million Jews today on this planet. And you think of two-thirds of them being killed and maybe around 4 million surviving. That remnant, that, that, that one-third, plus the 144,000 that, that are going to be alive when the Lord returns. And I often pray for my friends in Israel that they could be saved. I think about Gershon and different men, David, and different people that I know over there that I, we witness to and we share the love of Christ. And today I got an email from Gershon, and, uh, and he was telling us, it's bad. We knew it was, but he says it's bad. And he, hadn't, he hasn't worked in months. And um, he says he's, he's driving a taxi cab right now. And he says, I'm also using it as a time to go back to school and and uh, work on a degree in alternative medicine. <laughs> I don't know if that would, that's typical for him. But, uh, but pray for him. Pray for his family. And, uh, and I, th I think, Lord, let them, if, if they don't get saved, let them be one of the remnant that they get there. And, and I want to see him. And, uh, and so, so they, they're going to be saved. In those days, Judah shall be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name by which she shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, as I said, it says the Lord is our righteousness. Jehovah to Hishkanu. And here in verse 16, it tells us that the Lord 
is going to name the people of Israel with his name. And they will be called the Lord, our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, excuse me, and the Levites lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle mill offerings and to do sacrifices continuously. When the Lord comes back, Ezekiel tells us that when he establishes his kingdom, he's also going to establish a new temple in Israel. And the sacrifices are going to be given all the time, continuously there. And they are going to continuously offer up, as it says here, the meal offering and the, and the burnt offering. Now notice when you get into this, they, they don't offer up the sin offering. But the burnt offering, which was an offering of total consecration to God. It was an offering of dedication. And the meal offering was a meal offering of, of actual fellowship with God. It was the meal offering where you brought your offering to God and you shared a part of it with God and you got a part of it and you sat in the presence of God and you would eat. And, and you would not leave the presence of God until you ate your meal in front of him and with him. And, and that part of the meal that was given to the Lord was actually the, the fat of the, of the animal. And it would rise up as a sweet-smelling Savior to the Lord. And you would take the beef, basically, and start eating. And what's better than a good barbecue? You know, I mean, it's, it's just great, man. You know, and they would just, they'd just sit there and scarf down. And, and in Shiloh, they would do this all the time where the, t the tabernacle was for hundreds of years. Around the hillsides, you can find pot shears, uh, uh, plates, broken plates, just all over where the, temp, the tabernacle sat. And, 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 and there in Israel, they would do the same thing and eat in the presence of God for, with fellowship, having fellowship with God. Now, in the millennial kingdom, they're going to do the same thing. Now, are these offerings necessary for sin offerings or for... Any, no. I believe, and we'll be getting to Ezekiel in another year and a half or so, but, but we'll get there. But in Ezekiel, when we get there in the temple, we'll talk about it even more, but I'll share with you already that I believe that the reason that they're offering up sacrifices for that thousand years is much like what we do on the first Sunday of every month and the second Thursday of every month when we come to the Lord's table and we remember the Lord's death until he comes. See, it says till he comes. We remember what he did for us on the cross. It's an act of remembrance. And I think that the offerings are going to be for the Jews their Lord's table in a sense. We'll talk more about that as we get into Ezekiel, but, but it's, not, it's not for sin. It's because of sin has been paid. The, offer, the Lamb of God has been slain for them, and they recognized him. Well, it goes on. It says that the word of the Lord, in verse 19, came to Jeremiah, saying again, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant. Now listen to this. If you can break my covenant of the day, and my covenant of the night, that is, if you can stop the sun from coming up and going down, if you can keep it from being nighttime and daytime, and that there should be not day or night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David. Do you think God's serious about the promises that he's made with, with the people of Israel? God says, God says if, if, if you can stop it from being daytime and nighttime, if you can stop the seasons of the days, then my covenant with David 
can be broken, my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, and, the, and my ministers, as the hosts of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sands of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister unto me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Considereth thou not what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen, he has even cast them off, Thus they have dis, uh, despised my people, that they should be no more a nation before them. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not, not with day or night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return, and I will have mercy upon them. God says, listen, my promise to Israel to bring them back to their land and to keep them there is eternal. My promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my promise to David is eternal. And it's going to continue, and it will continue throughout his millennial reign. So God keeps his promises. I think that's why I pray for our president so much, for God to give him wisdom in his dealings with the nation of Israel. God says he'll bless those that bless him, that blesses Israel. You know, and, and, and that's why, I, I, God, I want to be blessed. Don't you? Does anybody want to be blessed here? You know, how many wants to be cursed? Okay. Well, then we're all on the right ticket here. You know, and God says, if you bless my people, in blessing I will bless, and in curse I will curse. It's that simple. And so, Lord, bless our president, that he be mindful of your promise. The word of the Lord which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his army, and all the kingdom of the earth, of his dominion, and all the peoples fought against uh, Jerusalem and against all its cities, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Ju uh, Judah, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord. Now, chapter 34. Now, let's go back to chapter 32 just very quickly and just read a portion Starting with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah. Zedekiah only reigned for 11 years. And here it is in his tenth year. King of Judah, which was in the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and, Jer and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the courts of the prison, which was in the king. Of Judah's house and Zedekiah king of Judah had shut him up saying why do you prophesy and say thus saith the Lord behold I will give this city into the hand of, Ju of the king of Babylon and he shall take it and Zedekiah king of Ju uh, Judah shall not escape out of the hand of, of the Chaldeans but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. Now, go back to chapter 34, because chapter 34 is the prophecy that chapter 32 tells us he prophesied. All right? It's not written in chronological order here. Jeremiah is kind of jumping around a little bit. But here he's telling us in chapter 34, this is the prophecy that he gave to Zedekiah in chapter 32. And so here's the, 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 um, the prophecy. He says, the, the God of Israel, in verse 2, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give the city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into the hand of thy, and thy eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Now, 
when the city of Jerusalem was besieged, Zedekiah attempted to escape. And he got a little ways away from Jerusalem in the siege. He escaped through the north section of the Temple Mount, where there is a cave that goes from the Temple Mount out to what they called Solomon's Quarry. It's still there today. And it is sits in between the Damascus Gate and the Herod's Gate. So if you have a map in your Bible, you can turn there, and just between Herod's Gate and Damascus Gate, there is a ravine or there's a big cave entrance that comes underneath the temple out through and into the valley there. That Zedekiah escaped from and he got as far as Jericho. He and his princes and all that got as far as Jericho, running from Nebuchadnezzar, but was overtaken. Now, he was taken into captivity. Ezekiel tells us that Ezekiel chapter 12 verse 13 tells us that he would see the king, but he would never see Babylon. But here we see that thou shalt go to Babylon. But Ezekiel says you'll never see it. Well, the clarification is found in 2 Kings where it says that what they did was they took Zedekiah in, in the, as they captured him. They took him, they killed his sons in front of him, and then they plucked out Zedekiah's eyes. And they led him off into captivity to Babylon. He saw Nebuchadnezzar there. He saw his sons killed. And he went to Babylon, but he never said seen Babylon because his eyes were plucked out. Fulfilling the scriptures. So you can put it all together in um, Jeremiah 34, Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 13. And then let me, let me give you that passage in 2 uh, um, Kings, I believe it was. I just want to make sure that you have it. If you'd like to check up on me. 2 Kings chapter 25 verse 7. And so you put those scriptures together. You begin to see the, how it all fits together and works together. God fulfills his word. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of, of, of thee. Thou shalt not die by the sword. You're going to live. Which he didn't. But thou shalt die in peace. And with the burnings of thy fathers, the burial and the burnings of thy fathers, the former kings who were before thee, and they will lament thee, saying, Ah, oh Lord, for I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Zedekiah, as I said, was the last known ruling king. Actually, Jehoiachim was the last king, but he wasn't the last king of Judah. Jehoiakim was in captivity but, but lived longer than Zedekiah and we'll get to that later on. But, but actually God gave Jehoiakim favor and we'll get to hear that later on. But he says, but thou shalt die in peace. And in verse 6 it says, then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words unto Zedekiah king of Judah in Jerusalem. When the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that, was, that were left, against Laish, Lachish and against, as a, um, well, Los Angeles and all these other cities. <laughs> uh, 
This is the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them, that every man should let his maidservants and manservants, manservants and every uh, man his maidservants, being a Hebrew or a Hebrewist, go free, that none should enslave them to wit a Jew his brother. Now, what was happening was they knew it was up. They knew that they weren't going to basically live or anything like that. It was going to, it's getting bad. And so they were kind of getting right. They wanted to get some things right with some of the people and, and all that. So Zedekiah told him, hey, let all your people, let all your slaves go. Release them. Give them their freedom. Give them their liberty. And, um, and, and so... So they did. Now, the reason that they were doing this was they were actually in violation of the Levitical law, the law of Moses. See, the law of Moses said that you could have a servant for six years, but on the seventh year, you were to let them go. They weren't doing that. They were holding them. They could be, if they wanted to be, they could become a bond slave. They could become a slave to a man, but they had to do it willingly. But they were forcing these people to stay their slaves. And Zedekiah was saying, hey, look, let them go. Don't force them anymore. And so he goes on. Now, when, when the princes and all the people who had entered into a covenant heard that, that everyone should let his man's uh, servants and every one of his maidservants go free, that none should enslave them anymore, then they obeyed and let them go. But afterwards they, re they turned and caused the servants and the handmaids whom they had let go free, go free to return and brought them into subjection for servants and for handmaids. These guys never learned. Therefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, At, at the end of seven years, let them, let every man go, his brother, a Hebrew, who has been sold in, uh, unto thee. And when he has served six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But, thou, uh, but your fathers hearken not unto me, neither incline their ear. That's, the, that's exactly what I was sharing with you. They hadn't done that. So, go down to verse 17. Therefore, Thus saith the Lord, you have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty, every one uh, to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword and to the pestilence and to the famine, and I will make you to be removed into the kingdoms of the earth. Now, you remember he says the reason that you're going away in captivity is because you've failed the seventh year sabbatical year of rest. You remember God says you to work the land for seven, six years, and on the seventh year you're to let the, ran, the, the land rest. They hadn't done that. They'd been in the land for 490 years. They hadn't done that. They owed God 70 years of Sabbath rest. Now, they were failing with the, the Jewish law that says you'll keep a slave for a man or a woman for six years and let them go on the seventh year. They were still, they were stealing God's Sabbath. That God was, they were violating his law. And so as they were doing this, God says, Well, I'm going to proclaim liberty for you. That's the sword, the famine, pestilence. That's what's going to get you. And so so he's he says, and you're going to be scattered. And I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant who have not performed the word. Now listen to this. The words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between these parts. Now what does he mean by that? What's he talking about? Well, when you made a covenant with an individual or with God, what you did was you took an animal and you cut that animal in half. It was a bloody mess. You'd cut them right down. You'd gut them. You'd open them up. And you'd spread the parts out. 
and then you would walk in between them. You would, you would walk right in between that animal and you would meet the man that you were making a covenant with and you would stand in that sacrifice and you would make covenant. And you were basically saying, if I don't keep my promise to you, let this happen to me. It was a, it was a strong covenant. And God says, you've made these covenants with me. And you haven't kept them. Matter of fact, we have an example of that in Genesis chapter 15. When Abraham made that covenant with God. You remember? I love that part. Oh, man, I get so excited. Because you remember what God did with Abraham? He didn't let him go into that covenant. He, kept, he, he fell asleep. Remember? He fell asleep and God passed through it. And he made the covenant with Abraham and said, I'll make the covenant. And what he was saying to Abraham, I know you're not going to be able to keep this promise and keep this covenant. And it's all going to be me. It's all going to be of grace. Me, I'm going to perform the, the promise. It won't be on you. And so he performs the covenant with, with Abraham as he passes through that. Now, they must have done the same thing because he said this also about the law. The children of Israel, when, then when they came to Exodus in chapters 15, around 20, 25, right around in there, uh, when they came to God and they made covenant with God at Mount Sinai, they must have done the same thing because God's referring to this that the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem and the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. Now, he says, he says, you didn't do that. You didn't keep your promise with me. Now, that's one thing. You remember when they came to Mount Sinai, God said, bring all the people. And God began to speak. And people said, oh, wait a minute. We don't want to hear that. That's too scary for us, Moses. You go up there and you get his message and you bring it down to us and whatever he says, we'll do. And you remember Moses did just that. He went up there, got the message, came down and told him and they said, whatever he says, we will do. We're his servants. We're committed to him. And at that point, they, made, they entered into covenant with God Almighty. And when they entered into that covenant with God Guess what? God believed him. God said, absolutely, I'm going to keep this covenant with you, and you better keep it with me. And when they broke that covenant, God says, wait a minute. We had a deal here. Your father has made a deal, and you are to keep this deal as well. And, and you didn't keep it. And so God's basically making them pay for their broken covenant. And I will even give thee into the hands of their enemies and into the hands of those who seek their life and their dead bodies shall be for food under the fowls of the heavens and to the beasts of the earth. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes will I give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army who are gone up for, from you. Behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to this city. Oh, again, the grace of God. He says, behold, I will command, saith the Lord. Just as I've commanded Babylon to come down, just as, as I've commanded you to go away into captivity, now I'm going to command that you return to the city and that you fight, uh, and they shall fight against it and take it. They're going to fight against it and take it, excuse me, and, and burn it with fire, and, and, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolate without inhabitation. That is that when he comes, he's going to have the, the Babylonians come back. And as I mentioned earlier, they left and they came back. Just as I've caused them or commanded them to come, they're going to come back. Don't think you've gotten away with, with it. They went down to Egypt, they'll come back, and they're going to finish it up. They're going to burn you up. They're going to tear the city up. There won't be anything left. And that's exactly what happened. God keeps his promises. God keeps his word. And, uh, and after, after 
they, left, they came out from Egypt. They destroyed, and that was it. That was the last time, really, uh, Babylon was, was, uh, was there in Jerusalem. They destroyed it. They left it desolate. There was nothing left. Matter of fact, about 80 years later, or actually longer than that, about 140 years later, a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar was talking to his brother that just got him back from a tour from Israel and said, hey, how's it going? How's, how's it look? And I said, it looks bad. I mean, the gates are broken down, burnt. I mean, it was pretty much like it was when Babylon had left it. And, uh, and Neb uh, not Nebuchadnezzar, Nehemiah, excuse me. And Nehemiah just said, hey, Lord, what do you want me to do? So Nehemiah prayed, and God sent him there to rebuild the walls and the gates of the city and establish the city once again. But God keeps his word, amen? And you know, if God's given you a promise, <laughs> do you know the same God that's made these promises is the same God that's given you the promises that you can hang on to and know that they're steadfast? They're not going to fail. They're going to be accomplished. The Lord is going to see to it. It says that he honors his word higher than his name. I mean, if he's given you a promise here, he says, I, I, I guarantee it. I put my name on it. And there's no higher name than this, than the Lord's name. And, but yet, he says, I'll honor this above my own name. And so, should we get worried about the promises that haven't been fulfilled in our life yet? We shouldn't. We should rejoice in them. We should hang into them, onto them, and, and, and just hang in there, saying, God, I, don't let me doubt. Don't let me doubt. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. 